Hello, James. Delighted to be chatting with you. Myself and my friend here, Steve Evans. Hi, James. Hello, Hi. Hello Steve. Yeah, very well, thank you. Excellent. So I believe you're in Cardiff, anywhere near the National Stadium or or you're near I, Cardiff Armstead. Well, Cardiff's newer stadium. I, I'm nearer the, the rugby, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm All right. Ooh, yeah. Pro probably about um, 10 minutes drive away. And then the Cardiff City Football Stadium is then probably another five minutes on top of that. Got to say, you're not far away from them all, really, are you? <laughs> no, no. no, it's all happening here this weekend. There's obviously uh, the Wales rugby, uh, yeah. Wales England rugby tomorrow. And uh, the bigger game for me will be Norwich, Cardiff City. So, um, yeah, lots of good sport this, off this weekend. Yeah, good game for Cardiff this Saturday. But uh, a Wales going to lose tomorrow, you reckon? They haven't done so well so far oh, this oh. season in the Six Nations. It, it's been it's been grim. I, I've even heard today from my brother who's going tomorrow that he has tickets to the game tomorrow, England Wales, and he can't give them away, what? which which is incredible. <laughs> yeah. I've never heard that ever. So no. I think that tells you everything you need to know. Yeah, nor have I. Normally, you know, if you, you know, they're grassed up, aren't they? That they go like uh, hot cakes. Yeah, I'm yes. really surprised to hear that. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's it's weird. Yeah, the last couple of years that it's really become more of a football. Certainly, Cardiff, a football city, and Wales as a nation, with what the national team has been doing and the success of Cardiff, Swansea, and you know what's yeah. happened with Wrexham is just incredible. Newport oh, back yeah. in the league, it's revitalised football, and rugby is at the same time really, really struggling now. Yeah, you're right there. Swansea have been doing okay in Cardiff, but yeah, as you say, and then Wrexham, yeah, well, it just goes without saying, doesn't it? And the rugby still yeah. taking second best, where as at one point you couldn't go into uh, Wales without it being rugby, rugby, rugby. Yeah, yeah, it really. Well, was. growing up, it was terrible. As, as a Cardiff City fan, growing up in the nineties, and it, it was just rugby constantly, and in, in his school and the media and everything. And so now to see the the three hundred and sixty degree turn and all the kids, yeah. you know. I'll, Football mad. There's more football pitches here and facilities. It's it's incredible. So is that what you do to relax? Pretty much. Do you follow? Uh, looking at some of your books, you obviously do follow a lot of football, <laughs> and you used to play yeah. football semi pro. So is that you're relaxing as well? Are you are you relaxed or have you got? It, it things? is. Yeah. Well, I'm getting I'm getting a bit old to, to still keep playing now. I, I've still play. <laughs> I still play eight aside every Tuesday with my friends, and I've got to the point now where I'm having ice baths afterwards because I can't walk the next day. Oh dear! So um, <laughs> I don't know how much longer that will last. But yeah, um, I've got a season ticket at Cardiff City. Had one for over twenty five years, probably longer actually. So um, yeah, that keeps me busy going going down there. Although it's pretty grim at the moment, and. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, love reading. Um, always got a book on the go. Loads of different genres, and um, yeah, I'm a massive movie buff as well. You might have, might have <laughs> can probably tell from my Twitter account. Yes, so, seen but, them. Yeah, yeah, some great film yeah. clips that you're putting up there. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'm obsessed with film. I love it. My house is covered in movie posters and yeah. stills and everything. So, yeah, that's that. Between those three and uh, looking after my four year old daughter, that that keeps me busy. Wow. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Obviously. You, yeah. you mentioned eight aside there. Yeah, you odd number. Aside, seven aside. Well, yeah. eight aside. It's, a weird, it's a weird pitch. It's almost like a half length pitch with goals which are the size of hockey goals. So five aside is way too small for it. So actually, oh, yeah. eight or nine aside is perfect. And, and to be honest, it's whoever turns up these days. So we'll take <laughs> we'll take whoever. But yeah, we've been playing. You're all getting, we've been all getting a bit year. older as well. It's harder, isn't it? Oh, oh the, the pace has gone. <laughs> The, the, the worst thing is, is when someone brings now they bring their sons who are like eighteen to twenty one, and and it, 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 you can tell your legs are gone because you, yeah they're, they're like little whippets. You can't you can't even <laughs> kick them anymore. They're so quick. I know. Tell me about it. Me about it. <laughs> you play football. Did you ever get to meet any of your football heroes? Ooh. When I was playing, yeah, there were a few things. Actually, when I was. Um, playing as a as a junior, the same year group, same in the same league as me was um, Robert Earnshaw, oh, and so we yeah. were kind of like head to head at the time. And he was obviously a, he went on and had an incredible career. And we yeah we played against each other a few times, and um, yeah, he battered you every was, time. <laughs> one, there's one time I did get the better of him, but yeah, I think it's fair to say he, he, I might have won the battle, but he won that war, and. Um, the, the funny one in terms of playing, I actually remember in about 2003, I was playing for um, Carl Leon, who were in the Welsh League, uh, Division 1 at the time. And we had a pre-season friendly against uh, Newport County. 
And they had, I don't think he lasted there for long because he was right at the end of his career. I don't know if you remember this name. I think he played for Palace for a few years. There was a player called Fan Z and he was the captain of China. And oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I vividly remember playing against him. For, he was playing for Newport County and it was exactly a year after he captained China in the World Cup against Brazil. Wow. And a year on, he was playing against Carl Leon in the Welsh League. I remember <laughs> after the game, he was getting changed, like in his pants on the pitch, getting changed. And I thought, how have you gone for, to playing against you know, Rivaldo and Ronaldinho? And you're playing against me on a pitch in Wales now. So that's one that always sticks in my mind. Huh. That's an incredible one, isn't yeah, it? You just yeah. imagine yeah. it. It's like, yeah, it's like from fame to shame in, a, <laughs> in 90 the minutes. The highs and lows is a cruel game. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan of music then. So are you uh, into Oasis and the Beatles or anything like that? Or, well, or yeah, I'm, off the wall stuff? I'm, a, I'm a fan of all genres, to be honest. I couldn't tell yeah. you I prefer one genre to another, but it, I, I, I was having a conversation with my friend the other day and my teenage years were, were in the 90s, which obviously is your, your formative years to what type of music you really get into. Mm. And obviously in the 90s, there was this great period where Britpop was massive and all the indie bands were huge and what that, what that was great on the one hand because you know i loved oasis so i followed oasis but what was fantastic was people like oasis would say if you like our music you should check out the beatles or the rolling stones or the yeah. kinks yeah. and so we were kind of enjoying our own generation's music but also being influenced by music from the 60s and it was a kind of like 60s revival in the 90s as well at the same time the beatles anthology came out at the same time oasis were big and it all kind of fed into each other. And it's the same with film. Like, you know, Quentin Tarantino was one of the biggest filmmakers of the 90s. Yeah, and he would be influenced by by movies from you know, the 70s and, and, and beyond and all different genres. So it was a great melting pot where you, you really loved your own generation stuff, but you were discovering a lot of the older stuff, which was the foundation of it all. Well, I'm not sure that happens anymore. I don't, you don't really see young musicians or filmmakers coming out now and really giving a lot of credit to to the masters and and you know the people who really got those genres um going and and were responsible for for, for so much so um, i kind of yeah i feel quite lucky to have grown up in the 90s and to, to been able to live through that era really before we move on to the main focus talking about your writing you qualified as a litigation lawyer are you still practicing oh no 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 no, no, no. That was, uh, yeah, I did qualify and I practiced for a few years. And um, yeah, it wasn't for me. It wasn't, okay. wasn't, wasn't for me. I, I'd always I'd always wanted to be a writer. And um, when the financial crash came in about 2008, 2009, and it was all just chaos and the law firm I was working in, um, it was just all a bit chaotic at the time. And I, I was in my late 20s. I wasn't married, didn't have a mortgage. And so I thought it's now or never. I've tried my hand at writing now or I'm going to be locked down. I'm going to be a lawyer forever. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I, had a, I had a swift career change after all those years of studying. Oh. Yeah, you don't actually remind me of a litigation lawyer. I don't, no. I don't know what one of those looks like, but you don't remind me of one of those. No. It just doesn't look like it's your yeah. thing. <laughs> well, relaxed, it, it, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't for me. No, definitely not. <laughs> so it's uh, writing your turn to books, particularly a couple of great ones at the back there. Yeah. Duncan Edwards, The Graces, Rocky. David Rowcastle, I'm familiar with uh, definitely those two, and probably others that I have uh, not mentioned. Um, so tell us a little bit about writing those books. I mean, Duncan Edwards and David Rowcastle, you obviously had to do a lot of research for those, I would imagine, unless... <laughs> yeah, just a bit, yeah. Unless you've been following them very, very closely over the years. So how did that go? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, for, for, first of all, for Duncan Edwards... Obviously, it was way before my time, but yeah. um, I was a massive football fan, and my father and my godfather I go to all the games with, are, are, even worse than me, fanatical. And um, so on the way to away trips and whatever, we'd always be talking you know, about footballers, who's the best of all time, who's the best you ever saw. And my godfather, who he used to travel to watch United in the... He, he travelled to everyone, he's not a United fan, but he used to go to travel to watch United in the 50s just because of Duncan Edwards. And he would always say, you know, we'd go watch Gaza or Messi or Ronaldo. And he'd always say, Duncan Edwards is the best. And I'd always laugh at him. They'd be daft. You know, we've just seen Ronaldo. They'd be silly. 
And he's always saying, no, no, Duncan Edwards was, was the best. He could play in every position and he was world-class in every position. Ronaldo couldn't do that. I was like, okay. So when it came to writing a book, I'm, oh, I loved football. I'd written a few other football books. And I was thinking of a, a football books to write. I thought there hadn't really been a really comprehensive book on Duncan Edwards at, at the time. There are a few now and there's a good one coming out soon, I think, from a, a really good, good football writer. Um, and I thought, well, I'm going to research this myself. I want to see how good this Duncan Edwards really was, because there's not a lot of footage available on YouTube or whatever. So um, that was a that was a great journey for me, being able to dig out the old archives, first of all, all the old newspaper reports. But you know, you're speaking to people um, who played with him and who, who were on the plane in the Munich disaster, like people like Harry Gregg and just incredible people who were, who were world-class footballers and, and had incredible football careers, but were just incredible, incredible people full stop. So, you know, people like Harry Gregg, he's one of the one of the great interviews. He was such a fascinating man to speak to. Um, so, yeah, that, that, was a, that was a really fantastic book. And it was a really hard book because, obviously, we all know the ending. We all know how devastating it is. But when you really get into it and you're writing about Duncan and a lot of the other young, young the Busby babes who died with him, and the magnitude of it hits you that, you know, Duncan Edwards and uh, you know, Eddie Coleman and people like that, Duncan Edwards would have been 29 in 1966. He would have cap- he would probably would have captained England. He probably would have played in, in the 1970 World Cup. And you just think, what a loss for British football. Because um, Manchester United probably would have swept, instead of Real Madrid winning, you know, was it seven European Cups at the time? Yeah, yeah. You know, United would, would have been toe-to-toe with them they would have won quite a few and for the for the England national team to lose Duncan Edwards and you know a lot of a lot of the Busby Babes the backbone just months before the 1958 World Cup it's just devastating you can't comprehend how awful it is yeah Yeah, it was good that you had the chance and you did write about him but what made you write about David Rowcastle because you're not from London or Arsenal are you you're more Welsh so why did you pick David you must have in there that you really liked about him or I did yeah there was a few things um obviously growing up in in, in Wales in in the 80s you know, Cardiff were terrible you know in the bottom division so as a young kid you know really young kid you'd let you'd always look out for you know, the top level football which there wasn't a lot on TV at the time I just always had this memory of watching Saints and Greavesy in the 80s and don't and watching David Rowcastle score this incredible goal um i think it was against middlesbrough or was it villa my, my memory's playing tricks on me now but um he was the first person i ever saw do a step over I, and I, I you couldn't rewind it then or go on youtube and see what he'd, he'd done so, and i just remember i was just amazed so whenever he came on tv i'd always watch out for david rocastle as a kid because I, I think wow he is a great player and he was he was you know, he's fantastic. He's such an amazing he burst on the scene and for England and Arsenal. And um, and then, you know, I remember then following his career then as a teenager and it had it, fallen off a cliff. So he was playing for like Hull City in his you know, 26, 27 um, in the third division when he'd been playing for, for Arsenal in England. And then I vividly remember stepping off a football pitch playing in university. And I was in university in London, so I was playing with a lot of Arsenal fans. And someone saying to me, um, Don't, uh, did you hear um, David Rowcastle died? I thought, what? Because uh, I don't think I knew he was ill. I'm not sure. If, I can't remember if it was publicised at the time. And so they, they had always stuck with me, his story. Like, how on earth did someone who had the world at his feet, how did their career go the way it did? And then they will die so young. It was awful. And that had always stuck with me. And then... Yeah, you know, again, there wasn't a book about him either, which I just found astonishing. So, um, yeah, that was again, that was a really, really tough book to write because such a such a sad subject. And mm-hmm. everyone he spoke to, everyone, there was not a single bad word, not a single bad story about him. He really was, uh, you know, a gentleman. But you know, you, you get into the roots of why his career went the way it did. It, you know, it basically turned out that um, as a youngster. He um he damaged his knee in a reserve game, and um, he needed to have a cartilage operation. And back then, it was before um, keyhole surgery, yeah, yeah. and they just they just botched the surgery, and um, it just meant then by the time he was in his mid twenties, his knee was it was completely shot. Um, 
Yeah, it was it was a it was a tough book to write. Um, there were a lot of it was a very volatile book to write as well. There was some people who really didn't want me to write that book. Um, and I was caught between two camps, really very very difficult. Um. But thankfully, the family I worked with, the, you know, the big bulk of the family I worked with, um, were really helpful and really appreciative of, of what I put together in the end. And you know, I spoke to some lovely people um, writing the books. I mean, people, I was you know, fortunate to speak to Glenn Hoddle, who was just fantastic. I could listen to Glenn Hoddle all day long. We went off, we, we went to speak about Duncan Edwards. He was going off and talking about his own career in Monaco and playing under Arsene Wenger. And so, so that was fantastic. Um, and just people, you know, like Gavin Peacock and Michael Dubry, and a big shout out to Gus Caesar as well. Just really lovely people um, who really kind enough to share their time with me. But um, we just ended up having the good long chats about football and life and everything. So yeah, I was I was really fortunate to do that. Yeah, just really before Terry carries on, I, I, I must say that uh, it, it does make a difference. When you're saying about nobody had a bad word to say about David Rocastle, you can't say that about many footballers, can you? You know, whatever's been written about them, there's always a bad word if it's Gaza or whoever, you know. But yeah, that was a big accolade to David Rocastle, really. Nobody could say anything against him. I think you can just kind of tell with David Rocastle as well. You just look at him, he just looks immaculate. He's got a really warm, friendly face and a warm, friendly smile. He always spoke beautifully and articulately. Um, yeah. And he was just a really kind, gentle, gentle guy. And and just I was speaking to Gus Caesar, who um who roomed with him at Arsenal, and he was just yeah. telling lovely stories of the two of them, you know, just on watching TV in their bedrooms before playing, um, you know, the games for Arsenal, and just chatting about everything. Um, yeah, yeah again, that that it, to, to think we lost him, I think it was, was thirty three, just just devastating. And I know his family is still still can't believe it today it just doesn't seem right you've seen now like all his colleagues working on sky yeah. and um in the media and how well they've done and you look at david roadcastle and how he you know even back in the 80s and 90s how he held himself and how he spoke and he was fanatical about the game studied the game he would have been a fantastic pundit i'm sure he would have been one of the big pundits on sky today and it's just a massive loss james talk about pundits did you have a do you have a meeting with emlyn hughes did you have a chat with the yeah. mighty Emlyn, yeah. The mighty Emlyn. This, my meeting with Emlyn Hughes is one of my all-time, not just me, but my my father as well, one of my favourite memories. And I would go as far as to say it's one of the nicest, like, famous people, footballers, I've ever had the pleasure to meet. Um, so, yeah, take me back now. This would have been in <laughs> probably about September 1990. And it was just after Italia 90. And as a kid, this was my first World Cup. I really, really remembered. So the, I'm fanatical Gaza, about football. That's the Gaza one, the Gaza tournament, I think of it as. Well, I got, I'll have a story about Gaza in a minute, actually, okay. from that time as well. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you the, the Emling one. So, um, I, and I was fanatical about football. And at the time, there was this kind of like explosion in VHS um, football videos. And I had this football video of Ian St. John picks his all-time best Liverpool eleven. Oh my! I can't tell you how many times I watched this video, and he obviously picked Emlyn Hughes in it. So, yeah. I was a kid, and I but I knew who Emlyn Hughes was. I thought he was fantastic. Anyway, so in September 1990, we're in TGI Fridays in Cardiff, at the last place on earth you expect Emlyn Hughes to be. Yeah. I still don't know why he was there to this day. And um, we sat down, and my dad looks across and goes, "God, <laughs> there's Emlyn Hughes over there," and I was like, like totally starstruck. And so my dad said to um to the waitress, oh, he gave her the menu and said, Can you go over and just ask Emily to, to sign this for my son? <laughs> and um she said, Yeah, yeah, of course. So she went over. Anyway, Emily Hughes stood up and he came and sat down with us. He must have been <laughs> honestly, he must have been there for half an hour, just with me, just talking. I, I was just talking to him about this Ian St. John video. And he he could not have been friendlier. He, he had all the time in the world to speak to me. He made made you feel like you're really important, and he's really enjoying the conversation. I was like, I was a kid, and um, you know, I think my my family and I were just so touched by it that he just took the time to do it. And it wasn't like a quick you know, sign an autograph. Yeah, thanks, great. It, you know, he, he really, really, um, it went went out of his way to do it. So um, yeah, uh, great memories of Emily Hughes. Brilliant. But Gaza, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is just a little, just a little yeah. story. 
anyway, so grew up loving Gaza from the 1990 World Cup. And obviously all my football have been Cardiff City and, and lower division football. So after the 1990 World Cup, my dad said, come on, we're going to go to White Hart Lane. Um, I think it was the first home game after the 1990 World Cup. Yeah. And Tottenham were playing Derby. So there was Gary Lineker, Gaza, um, Peter Shilton was in goal for Derby. So, you know, the, and, great, um, great. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, by luck, should, by luck should have it. Obviously, fanatical about Gaza. And um, first top flight game I'd ever seen. And Gaza scored his first and only ever hat trick in English football. Wow. Uh, he, and he was, it's on YouTube against Derby County in 1990. And it was before he had the injury and when he was in his real prime. And it's, you've just never seen anything like it. It was like it, my dad always said, if you remember Ginger Tompkins on, um, was it Benny Hill? Ginger Tompkins or Benny Hill? And he used to have the football attached to his boot with the with the uh, with a piece of lace. Oh yeah. He, he said he was like watching Ginger Tompkins. It was as if he had the ball glued to his foot. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just going back to David Rowcastle, I mean, uh, people like Lee Dixon, Paul Merce, and David Seaman all went on to be pundits, didn't they? You know, and uh, obviously that never happened with David Rowcastle. It just well, yeah, it was just a, such a shame. Such a shame, really. You, you just you could just see him doing it. He, he would he would have been he would have been the poster boy for it because he was exactly yeah. so many so many pundits I listen to now without any naming any names. <laughs> it's just they're just so so inane and they're just telling you what you see and you're saying you're getting paid millions of pounds to tell me what I'm seeing here and you know, they don't really have the voice for it or or, or the gravitas with it. But but Rowcastle really studied football. You know, he's really. You know, everyone would say they'd be talking deep into the night about tactics and training sessions. And this is in his early 20s. And it's the way he held himself and spoke. He would, it would have been fantastic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, was, was, was the hard work connecting with your publisher, James? Curtis Brown? Oh, the agent, agents, literary yeah. agent. Um, it wasn't so difficult for that because yeah. I'd already published a few books before and I had a previous oh. literary agent. So I was switched from that literary agent to Curtis Brown, oh. um, which, which I was very happy about because Curtis Brown, a you know, top literary agent. Big, big uh, yeah. yeah, my my agent there, Gordon Gordon Wise, is is an absolute gem. He's been such a great mentor for me. Um, and I was I was very fortunate to get my first literary agent, which set me on the way because I'd written a few Cardiff City books and local books, and that was all I ever really had any ambition to do, really, I suppose. And then I wrote the Duncan Edwards book. I didn't have a clue what I was doing, really. Not having a, any idea about agents or anything. But um, so I sent out the manuscript to a few agents. And typical authors write a story as no one gets back to you or no one is yeah, accepting. Yeah. We had that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's a nightmare. Yeah. And thank God my, my literary agent I wrote to at the time was a Manchester United fan. <laughs> and so he picked it out the slush pile of all these other books he'd been sent. I was like, oh. <laughs> Manchester United. So I was, I was very, very little bit of luck there, and then that that set me on my way then to, yeah, speak working with you know some of the bigger publishers in London and um, doing doing breaking out of my little Cardiff bubble, which I've been doing. Yeah. Then you went on to I think this came after did it Alligator Blood, which is about an online uh, poker player. It's like, oh, do you know what? It's it's a, yeah, a bit of a change <laughs> change of pace that one. It's, it's the true story of a guy called Daniel Zvetskov, who's this Australian tech whiz kid who was basically blamed for the total collapse of online gambling in America, where players lost billions. And he, he was blamed and he was arrested by the FBI, went into witness protection, the mafia were involved. It's kind of like Wolf of Wall Street in a way. Um, and it's just a crazy story. And I saw it in the paper one day and I thought, I've got to write that. that, that, that yeah, that's got movie written all over it. It's got all these great <laughs> locations, the Gold Coast, Vegas. Yeah, I could go visit them as well. Um, <laughs> wow. It sounded uh, yeah. great. It sounded great. <laughs> and I did. Yeah, you know, I had quite a few trips. I basically went all over the world to put this thing together. Wow. Uh, quite a few trips yeah. to Australia and Vegas and New York and L.A. Brilliant. And it sounds fantastic. But it was the most awful book to research <laughs> because wow. you're, trying to, you're trying to interview people who were in witness protection who were in the mafia, who were in jail, billionaires who were wanted by the US government. Oh, oh. And as you can and as you can imagine, 
it got pretty hairy at times. I, I, I had death threats. I had my computer hacked. There were lawsuits. Hell. It went <laughs> wow. mental. So considering what I've been doing, you know, Duncan Edwards and speaking, you know, <laughs> you know all, all, all that type of story, to do something like this, I, I've probably got in over my head. Um, but yeah, some great experiences <laughs> looking back now. And it, you know, I, it's still rumbling on now. There's still talk of, that it's been through multiple hands in terms of turning it into a film, TV show, documentary. Um, and it's still it's still rumbling on now. People still want to do it. It's just a very difficult one to put together. So we'll see what happens with that. But yeah, it was that kind of broke me out from just doing football. Yeah. Big difference. Yeah. I was gonna ask about the um you collaboration with KSI or the best selling I am a bell end. <laughs> Tell us about this great title. <laughs> oh, do you know what's terrible? Because for a time, that was my best selling book. And everyone always says to you, oh, What books have you written? What was the best one you've written? And you'd have to say, Oh, it's called I'm a Bell End. And they'd, they'd go, oh, It's terrible. Um, yeah, that was a funny one because um, yeah, I, was, I wanted to write something very, very, very commercial um, to prove I could do something like that. Um, something that had the prospect of being a bestseller. And um, th- at the time, there'd been an explosion of these YouTube books. I knew nothing about YouTube at all. And so I did some research and I thought you know, KSI at the time was nowhere near as well known as he is now. But in 24 YouTube, million followers he's got now, wasn't he, on YouTube? Crazy. 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 You know, he's, 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 now, like, he's known now with that outside the YouTube bubble. Most people have heard of KSI. Yeah. Um, back then, they hadn't. He was just in this YouTube bubble. And I, 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 I could see all these other YouTubers getting book deals. And I looked at KSI and I, I saw he had a big following. But then most importantly, I thought, he's got the personality. He is actually someone who could carry, pull off a book and make it really funny and stand out. And, um, you know, he, he really did. You know, he, he's someone who's a massive personality, who's actually got a lot of talent. Like what, what you see on YouTube it's just one side of him. He's you know, very intelligent and he knows exactly how to work social media. He knows he's like a chameleon. He can go from rapping to boxing to YouTube to books. And um, I was really, yeah, I was really fortunate um, to work with him. We've you know, got a publishing deal. We just came out. It was just crazy. Again, going from writing about Duncan Edwards and things to just coming out with the things <laughs> we were coming out with. It was like being, I was good, you know, hang out with him i just felt like a kid again he just made <laughs> it really funny and um yeah we, the publisher said to him said to him so what do you want to call it and he just said i want to call it i'm a bell end and i remember all the publishers <laughs> we were in a meeting and they all were like what and i almost sunk behind my desk like no and he was laughing going, that's what i'm going to call it and then we had the most ridiculous meet um conference call because it was going to get published in america and I'll never have a pub- conference call like this again with a publisher. The, the American publishers were concerned that their American audience wouldn't know what a bell end was. <laughs> so we had a long conversation of what, what words American audiences would settle for. And in the end, it was published in America as I am a tool. Oh, but yeah. all the Americans bought the British one because they wanted they wanted the bell end. Oh, yeah. They didn't want the tool. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was good fun. And do you know what? it really opened my eyes when we did these book signings and I did a few more YouTube books with KSI and his brother and his, his YouTube group, the Sidemen. Yeah. book signings. These guys were filling football stadiums. Like we were doing old Trafford and St. Oh, James's yeah. park. Yeah. And wow. It was like Beatlemania. It was nuts. So I, I'm, I'm really glad. I probably won't do any more of those type of books, but I'm so glad I, I actually had the chance to sample a bit of that, that madness. It was great at the time. That's, oh, that is incredible. It's it so yeah. funny. It's so, yeah, yes. What are you working on at the moment? And what's in the pipeline now? I mean, football or I'm a more, I'm a more of a bell end. <laughs> oh, God, no. <laughs> oh, God, no. Um, I do, I've tended to do a lot of ghostwriting recently. So I'm working on a quite a big, not ghost, editing, ghostwriting. I kind of do a mix of all, all of it. And so I'm working on quite a big Lawrence of Arabia project at the moment oh. for, um, for someone. Um, which is just a great subject, you know. Wow, yeah, yeah. it's absolutely it's fascinating. great film, great story. Oh, I, I'm yeah, watching that film constantly at the moment, yeah. and um, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure to write about someone so interesting. So I'm really enjoying that, and I should finish my first fiction book um, by the summer, 
and then hopefully that'll be out next year. So fingers crossed, all being well, and I'm keeping my keeping myself busy between the ghost writing and doing my own stuff. Brilliant. What advice would you give to a new writer, a would-be writer, who ideas in the head but haven't put things down on paper yet? It's. So you know what? Everyone's got different advice, and I can only speak from my own experience, yeah. right or wrong. But, but my advice is it's so hard to break into the industry and to get anyone to take you seriously. From my own experience, I, I would say for your first book, try and write something, uh, like a non-fiction book on someone local that hasn't really been written about before because you're more than likely um, to get it published by a small publisher, Um that's what I did. That's how I broke in, writing about a Cardiff City player. Yeah. And it got me a small publisher. But it kind of gives you then um, that foundation of that you can say to people, I'm a published author. Mm-hmm. And after that, you can then go and then write a book where you want to target an agent and a big publisher. Because the, the smaller publishers, you don't need an agent. Um, you can go directly to them. And it, I think it, it really helps to be able to, as a springboard. And also, for the smaller books, people are a lot kinder when you're writing about a local local hero um, and you're from the area, yeah. like my first yeah. book, you know, the, the amount of mistakes, so I can't read it now, it's unreadable. Because um, you know, you're allowed to make mistakes, you're allowed to learn. Yeah. Um, it's a massive learning process. So I would say, yeah, do your first book on someone local and um, it's a great springboard then to, to build on from there. That's great advice. We haven't heard that before, have we, Steve? No one's ever we said haven't that. Know it, so that's worth knowing, yeah. So you yeah. could write a, a, a book about Malky Mackay, the old uh, Cardiff manager, for example. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, yeah. worked, it, it worked for me. Um, it might not work for everyone, but I think it's the way yeah. to get way to kind of like get your, your your foot in the door. That's great advice. But on that note, James, Thanks. I think our time's caught up with us. It, it's been a delight chatting with it, and it's I always say this, but I, I mean it. It's, it's absolutely flown by. 40 minutes. Really, yeah. It should have been 30, but that 40 has gone by. So really appreciate been, your time, but yeah. thanks, and let's keep in touch. It's been really and, and interesting. So and, and very humorous as well. It's been funny. <laughs> Could we, thank, well, you thank you for having me on. Yeah. I really appreciate it. I've no, been after my daughter all day, so to have an adult conversation has been fantastic. <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> James, maybe another one when you get the f- fiction book when that's due out. Maybe you could book another. Definitely. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Brilliant. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Brilliant. Thanks. Well, but for now, Thank cheers. You yeah. cheers. Have a great weekend, guys. See ya. Thanks. And you.